From the University of California, Irvine, this is UCI Minds Spotlight on Care, the podcast where we share stories, experiences, tips, and advice on caring for loved ones affected by Alzheimer's and other dementias. Hello and welcome. I'm Virginia Nave, and this is Spotlight on Care. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Mr. Steve O'Leary. Steve and I thought that since it was summertime, it would be a good idea to have a guest who could speak on the topic of traveling with a loved one who was affected by Alzheimer's or other dementia. Before I introduce our guest, Steve and I like to say a few words about our own experience, which might relate to what our guest has to say. Steve, did you travel with Patty? Yes, I did. Um, I... uh... I kind of went through, a, I, I think, a fairly typical experience, which is you never know when the last tri- trip is going to happen. But when, you, when it happens, you know it. Um, <laughs> we had taken a wonderful family vacation to the Bahamas uh, and rented a, a wonderful ship and taken all our kids. And it was, it was fine. Patty did really, really well. I... Uh, is to quote my daughter, did you even have a good time, Dad? Because I was busy <laughs> worrying about her. We then came back and went to our condo in Hawaii a few months later. And this, the moment we got there, she was ready to come home. She was disoriented, had difficulty. She'd been there a dozen times or more. But uh, this was it, the, the no more travel, because it was very disorienting and difficult for her. Yeah, it was nice of you to try. Yes. I didn't do a lot of traveling with mom. The only trip that I took her on was a road trip from Southern California to our relatives area in Arizona. And it was at the very beginning of her disease. And uh, the whole way in the car, she kept remarking about the trucks. Oh, that truck is huge. Look at that truck. And I thought I, I kept thinking, okay, patience, patience, patience. We got to one of the family gatherings and she kept repeating questions and repeating statements. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? Um, So I didn't get very brave later on um, taking trips with her, but I do remember that it was a little bit frustrating, even in the beginning. So let me introduce our guest that I have with us or that we have with us here today and tell you a little bit about her. Today we have with us Jeanette Marantos. Jeanette began writing freelance articles for the Los Angeles Times in 1999, and she joined the staff in 2018. Jeanette lost her husband to Alzheimer's disease in 2021, and before he passed, she published an article about her experience of traveling with him, both by plane and a car trip. She learned a lot doing that, and she's here to share it with us. Fortunately, Jeanette's tips will apply to traveling with either a spouse or a parent. Welcome, Jeanette. We're glad you're here with us today. I'm so glad to be here. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Your article for the LA Times described what you learned by taking trips with your husband during various stages of his disease. First, tell us about your experience of flying to New York and then Germany to visit family. My husband, his name is Stephen, and he, um, he was diagnosed in, in April of 2011. And then it was just uh, kind of the precognitive, gosh, I can't think of it, PCI. In, in, MCI, mild MCI, cognitive mild impairment. Mild cognitive impairment, right. Um, with the, with the belief that it was probably going to be Alzheimer's. And so I thought it was important for us to try to make a trip. Um, in 2013, he had family in New York and, and siblings in New York and also in Spain, his sister, uh, whom he was very close to. So we made this trip and it helped that my, uh, our youngest son was studying in Heidelberg in, in Germany during that time. So we, we went there with them. And, I mean, we went there figuring we'd see him, but we flew to New York, we saw his brother, and then we got on the plane to go to Frankfurt 
And it was a long kind of a, it felt like we were on the plane for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And, we, and I tried to be mindful of, of uh, just traveling uh, that far. I wanted to make sure that we stayed up as late as we could before we fell asleep to try to acclimate to the time zone there. And so we went for a walk after we arrived and we, neither one of us had been to Frankfurt in our lives. And uh, Stephen kept pointing out these landmarks and telling me that not only had he visited Frankfurt before, but he had lived there for over a year, which I knew was not at all true. And it took a long time, but later I began to realize uh, the next day that he actually thought we were still in New York. And he had lived for a while in the city. And so he just, the whole plane ride never registered. He never registered that we had left uh, New York. That was the first inkling of what we were in for. Yeah, it took some patience. And I'm sure you were scratching your head half the time. What the heck? Well, he was, he, he really, he was just starting. I mean, the, the thing that happened is that it, as his disease progressed, he became less and less interested in leaving or going anywhere outside of what he was comfortable with. And that, that little realm got smaller and smaller um, as, as his disease progressed. But um, we... We did have some nice times, but it was really a struggle. And I was so grateful that um, my my son was with us because he, we we rented a car and we drove down to Spain from Frankfurt, and we were able to see his sister. And he really remembered that, and he was able to tell people about that when we came back, and that made an imprint on him. And some friends we had in France, we we stopped in and saw them. But I don't think any of the rest of the trip really registered to him, except as just confusion and a little bit of misery. Why are we here? We, we, my son's a musician and he really wanted to go and see an opera in Verona and we, we had a wonderful time there, but I don't think any of that registered and he uh, couldn't understand why we were there or what we were doing. Okay, so fast forward seven years into his disease, you wanted to take a trip to the state of Washington, I believe you said Seattle area, for the birth of your grandchild, tell tell us how that tell us how that flight went. Well, you know, it was in February of 2020, and so we were just sort of entering this sort of confusion about where were we going as far as COVID uh, or coronavirus, which was at that time. We got on the plane, and he. Uh, he was, we, we luckily didn't have to wear masks at that point. Uh, there were just people, I noticed there were some people around me who had masks on, but Stephen was frightened of the masks and he never understood why he needed to wear masks or, uh, and, and refused to do so, which, you know, it's very hard to get someone, especially an adult man to wear a mask if he doesn't want to wear it. So, um, on the plane, though, we we had a seat in the I, – I was in the aisle uh, in the middle, and he was uh, next to the window. And we were good for the, like, first five, ten minutes. And then he began asking me, what – you know, when can we go home? And then he, he just sort of started this thing of, what are we doing here? Why can't we get in the car and go home? I want to go home. I want to get in the car and go home. And it was just this, he sort of start this and I would explain that we were on a plane. We were going to see our son and daughter-in-law and that they were about to have our first grandchild. And he would listen to that for a couple of minutes and then he would just start again. It was kind of like press replay. And the woman next to me, who was sitting next to the aisle, at one point, after about an hour of this, she, she put her hand on my leg and she said, oh, honey. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it was just, and I knew, I mean, I was trying to keep my voice down, but he was getting a little bit agitated and I kept trying to talk him down and got a beer for him. You know, I was just, I was trying to relax him a little bit. And um, we finally were able to, to get through that but it was uh it was the last time we did fly a couple more times uh, but i started making sure that we always sat at the very back next to the restrooms because that was the other challenge is that he'd need to get up 
And then it was this long march down the aisle and um, I couldn't send him by himself. And it was, it, it just became untenable after a while. It, that was the last time that I really felt confident about doing that. And then when we hit COVID, of course, it, it became impossible because we couldn't we, we couldn't travel at all with him in a public setting because of his refusal to wear a mask. Oh, interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. And then there were all these things converging. I mean, I couldn't send him to a restroom by himself after that because, uh, I mean, not that specific incident, but I began to learn that he, he, he really couldn't manage that by himself anymore either. I know you can tell us a lot about that um, in our next part where you're going to tell us what it was like to do a long car trip with him, which, of course, there are restrooms and restaurants and gas stations. And anyway, let me uh, just frame that a year after you're flying to Washington, you knew that flying again was out of the question. So you wanted to visit your family. And you thought driving from Southern California to Washington would be possible. So <laughs> tell us about that one. Even on short trips, Stephen would get agitated if he was in the car longer than about five or 10 minutes going to the store it was out of the question. And at that point, we were so far into COVID. We really weren't, he wasn't going with me to stores. His caregivers would stay with him while I went to the store. Um, so I knew if we traveled, I was going to have to figure out some ways to keep him calm in the car because it's a two-day drive uh, for us. It is about 1,300 miles. I was going to have to figure out how to get him into restrooms without a mask because, again, uh, that that added another little dimension that um, I didn't know what I was going to do with that. And then a, a, a very, I, I figured I could bring the dogs with me. We have two um, medium-sized dogs and, that Stephen really loved, and they loved him. And um, I, I figured that, you know, they could help keep him calm. But, but I, then I started thinking of logistics. How am I going to get gas, get Stephen into the restroom? Mm-hmm take the dogs out and leave Steven in the car. I mean, I was just, it was too many balls to juggle. And so then uh, a very, very dear friend of mine who also happens to be a, a camp director in central Washington, she, um, she said, look, why don't I come with you? And I, I was just like, Oh my gosh, what a, what a gift. What a nice friend. She's an awesome friend. And then she and her husband, her late husband, had been, were some of our closest friends in, in Washington. And I, I can't emphasize enough that if you're going to do this, you need someone who's going to be sympathetic mm -hmm. to your partner who has dementia and not just someone who's going to sit there and while you're grinding your teeth, help you grind your teeth because, oh my gosh, this is just, you know, so crazy. I mean, uh, she was calm. She was patient. She had great ideas uh, for distracting him. She was an endless supply of little words, and games, and, and, you know, and, and distracting him. Oh, look at that out the window. And I mean, things that I was so, I was getting flustered and frustrated, and she would just sort of calmly give him another fruit snack or something she thought would distract him. And it just made all the difference on that trip. It, it made the trip possible. You said you made a good music playlist. I did. He had a playlist that he of all um, his caregivers played it for him all the time. And we would listen to a music all the time. It really was calming for him. And that could, that would usually buy us a good 30 minutes or so before he would start mm -hmm asking well, where are we and what are we doing and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and when can we go home? <laughs> and when can we go home? <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah, that was, yeah. So he, he, 
he um, and then my friend uh, would uh, she she would take the dogs. We'd stop for gas. She would take the dogs, and she could do some advanced work as far as what kind of restrooms. And you know, I tried to call ahead and find out. I was hoping that, for instance, California has tremendous uh, rest stops uh, with all kinds of things. But I was looking for rest stops that had. Um, family type bathrooms where you can go in and you know accompany your your spouse or child for that matter into the restroom uh, all you know opposite gender or, or differently gendered person and uh, they just even their public relations people couldn't tell me you know they said basically it's just there's some some places and some under construction and some that are closed i found one that was completely seemed done but it was completely um barred and there was a sign outside the regular restrooms which said that you know people uh company disabled people uh can bring them into this bathroom and you know you basically don't be surprised if you see somebody leaving another person a man or a woman you mm -hmm. know into the bathroom so that's what uh that's what i ended up doing with a lot of these rest stops is i just walked them in and sometimes there were people in there and sometimes there weren't and um i think by the that time in steven's disease it was pretty obvious that he uh that he wasn't functioning normally so there was they were sometimes startled to see an adult man in the restroom but they quickly recovered and and understood that there was some reason for this i think that's an interesting question um that we faced um you choose to tell you chose to take steven into a woman's bathroom right yes as i took patty into a man's bathroom um, yes. If you find yourself in these situations, um, ideally you go in there when there's no one in there, but, um, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. And I would almost kind of announce, hey, my wife is ill and we have to use the men's bathroom. And most people were just like, no, OK. <laughs> I was constantly, I don't know, taken by surprise, but uh in deep appreciation for the kindness of strangers. I, I found again and again, people who said, you know, my grandfather or my mother or my brother that, you know, have dementia. And they, there was, there was a sort of understanding that this is sort of a, a problem and a, a, a lot of sympathy. We want, we stopped at one rest stop. It was a pilot gas station in Oregon and near Klamath Falls. And the the place was packed. I mean, these, these, these pilot gas stations are usually just full of people, travelers. And I didn't know how I was going to get Steven through, through the store into, and then there was, I didn't know what kind of restrooms they had there. So my friend walked in and sort of did some uh, advance work. And she came back and said that the manager says that we're supposed to drive around to the backside where only the trucks are permitted to come. And she'll open the door for us and you can just walk in straight into one of the shower rooms, which usually costs around $15 to rent for an hour. And uh, I offered to pay and she said, no, no, it's just fine. Um, you know, I completely understand. And uh, I, I walked him into the restroom and um it it was it was a gift it was such a relief to be able to do that didn't you say there was one time when he was in the men's room and you were not with him he took off his yeah. coat and we handed were it to some guy <laughs> we were trying we were at a jc penny's in um in uh california <laughs> in los angeles and uh, we we were looking for i we were looking for some new pants for him and uh, this again, this was before uh, this was just just prior to the real outbreak of the uh, pandemic. But I he needed some new clothes and, and I, you know, they were having a big sale, blah, blah, blah. So we went in and, and he used to be very fan, picky about what he would wear. So I thought, OK, we'll just take it and do it this way. And he um, I noticed that he wanted to go into one of the other dressing rooms and I realized he was looking for a toilet so I 
quickly steered him. I didn't want that to happen in the dressing room. And we went and a guy showed me where the bathrooms were. And I, I, I sort of showed him into the door and he walked through and I sort of lurked outside the men's bathroom. Another thing that I, I got very good at doing. <laughs> good at. Um, yeah. Right. And, he, <laughs> and, and these children, <laughs> These children were standing at the door. They kind of had the door propped open, and they were looking into the restroom with kind of astonishment. These looked of astonishment, and they looked over at me like, like what is going on? And, I, and they didn't say anything. They just had these big eyes, and I thought, oh, oh. And and about four or five minutes later, I, I said, oh, I said, is my husband in there? And they said, my dad is with him. And I was like, oh. Okay, well, so, and so I just sort of sat there and wrung my hands for a few minutes, and this very nice man came out, and he had Stephen's jacket and his hat in his arms, and he led Stephen out, and he gave me his jacket and hat, and he said that Stephen had taken off, that he was washing his hands, and Stephen walked up to him and gave him his coat and gave him his hat, and then he tried to... um tried to pee in the sink and the guy very kindly yeah the guy very kindly directed him to the urinal and then led him back outside um with relief i think he was a little initially a little worried about what he was gonna do with this guy. So, what a lovely man that was he was he was so kind and his children were there and god only knows what lesson they took from all of this but i hope they they took a lesson of kindness and, and patience for people because I, um, yeah, it, it, they were, they were obviously astonished at, at what was going okay, on. I hate to keep that. bringing up bathroom problems, but you said oh, no, it's one huge. of the, I know it is, it is. It's a really little discussed and huge issue in this kind of thing. So you were in a hotel room and in the middle of the night, you see him going out the door. Well, I was asleep. We were in a hotel room when it was kind of an old fashioned hotel room. We were in Oregon going up to Washington. And it was one of those rooms where like an old motor court where you, where you walk outside your room and you're out in the parking lot basically. And so we had gone to bed and I woke up and I saw this figure at the door and I realized it was Stephen. I'd put the little chain on, but Stephen had taken the chain off and opened the door and was walking out into the parking lot. So I leapt up and ran after him and I said, what, where are you going? And he says, well, I'm, I'm looking for the toilet. And I said, okay, well, <laughs> follow me. And we went back, <laughs> we went back and I, I led him to the bathroom. And I learned after that a couple of things. One was I always kept the light on in the bathroom. So that was the only light in the hotel room. And the other thing I learned was that just putting the little chain on wasn't enough, that I started putting a chair in front of the door, and then I would put some bag that has something crinkly or noisy in it. So if you moved it, it was going to make, you know, we always had a snack bag that we had, and it was always full of like, you know, crinkly bags like potato chips or whatever. And so if you moved it, it made enough noise that it would wake me up. And I usually slept pretty lightly, but... Yeah. So anyway, uh, and I that that kept us from because that slowed him down enough that if he did try to move the chair and stuff. But I found that it it was better to have the light on because once he knew he would go toward the light, so it it made a huge difference for him. Good tips, really good tips. It's confusing. It 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 was confusing for him. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know why we were there. And um, but he didn't know that he had to use a toilet. So uh, the, the drive on the way home was OK. It was. My friend insisted on coming back with her. She must have seen how desperate I was. And she insisted she had a really nice time. She, <laughs> she said it was great to have this time to talk and reconnect. And we did. We had two days in the car. And, you know, we don't see each other that often. So it was it was a wonderful time to reconnect. But she made the trip possible. I, I really would recommend that if you are going to embark on a trip like this, that you find someone like that in your life who can accompany you and can be there for you and for your your companion, your husband, your, your spouse, whoever it is, 
because sometimes you just need to be able to walk away. I, I said in my article, you need to learn how to count to 10 backwards and forwards multiple times, but I am not very good at that. I, I, I kind of go zero to a hundred sometimes and I have to just back away and she could run interference. And it was, it was really, really helpful. A godsend, as you say. I noticed that you mentioned uh, that um, to make sure you were with people who understand dementia behaviors yes. as one of your tips. Could you talk a little bit about that? We, we were lucky that we still have a, uh, our house in Washington. And so we were able to stay there. It was, it was vacant at the time and we were able to stay in that house. People, I mean, we have, a, we have a lot of friends, a lot of people who care about Stephen and me, but the reality of living with someone with dementia is it just takes people by surprise. It's uh, unsettling. Some people find it disgusting or they are uh, really uncomfortable about it. Uh, I had one close person who just couldn't be alone with my husband. It, it just upset her too much. And th that and that took me by surprise. It was not something I expected. And uh, I and I it made it taught me that you really have to to if you're gonna stay with a friend, you need to go over all of this. This is someone who's been around Stephen, who knows what he's like. I mean we did stay with a, a, another dear friend who would come to our house who knew who who had experienced all of this and was really very welcoming and supportive and understanding but it it really didn't work with other people who who were sympathetic in in you know in, in theory but were really um who didn't know how to deal with the reality of of living with someone who's got dementia and uh, and it, it made it very uncomfortable. One of the reasons that we're trying to do this podcast and get some information out there, uh, there's a lot of sources now with information about dementia, but if you've had no contact with it at all, you don't know how to react. Yeah, I, I would just don't assume that just because they're an old and dear friend or even family that they're going to... Um, be prepared for this. Talk to them. Have they have they spent any time with with you and 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 your husband or your you know your person with dementia? How were they during that time? Uh, you know those are those are things you really need to consider, especially if you're staying for any amount of time. It's it, it, it's going to be stressful enough on your on your companion and for you without this added stress of people in another room going, oh my God, you know, how do we let this happen? Uh, before we wrap up this podcast, Steve, do you have anything else you want to add or ask? Along this line of uh, being associated with people that understand, I, I think I, I echo Jeanette's comment. You know, there were so many people that were so supportive, but there were also people who, um, either attempting to be con trying to make a good situation, a bad situation good, would say to me, I I'm not sure that she's all that, that she's got that serious a problem. Yeah, I know. I heard that a lot too. And of course, these are, <laughs> these are people who, who had seen Patty, who were friends, but saw her once every year or six months. And I finally sat her down and said, you know, Carol, I love you, but girl, you, you don't understand because you're not living it day to day. Can I add one other thing that I, I think is important if you're traveling with um, someone with dementia? Make sure they have some kind of identification on them. Ah, good point. I mean, my husband refused to wear an ID bracelet, but his wallet, I had identification in his wallet. Um, I had numbers to call in his wallet. Uh, I, for a while before his, it got too bad, he had a phone and he knew that if, and I had written on the phone, I taped it on there and said, press three for Jay. 
which I was Jay, and he knew that if he pushed that number, it would it would call me. It was it was automatically dialed because he'd forgotten how to even really use the phone. So you just just make sure there's some way to identify and to contact you. Well, that night in the hotel, he could have been long gone. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and he wouldn't have had his wallet with him <laughs> because he was in his pajamas. <laughs> Oh, my God. I hadn't thought about that. Well, we can't thank you enough for being here with us today, Jeanette. Um, Very, very helpful information. Well, it's so important to talk about this because you kind of make it up as you go along. And so it's very helpful to have people like you discussing these issues. Well, uh, I will say to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. And be sure to check back with us soon for more caregiving advice on Spotlight on Care. Spotlight on Care is produced by the University of California, Irvine, Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders, UCI Mind. Interviews focus on personal caregiving journeys and may not represent the views of UCI Mind. Individuals concerned about cognitive disorders, prevention, or treatment should seek expert diagnosis and care. Please subscribe to the Spotlight on Care podcast wherever you listen. For more information, visit mind.uci.edu.